recording. Okay, and now go. Good morning, everybody. We're just waiting for people to join the webinar. We'll just wait a few more seconds until we get a few more participants, but good morning. Well, welcome everybody. It's morning here in Sydney, so good morning uh, and good afternoon to those of you in Colombia. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Pamela Humphreys, and it's my absolute pleasure to be the moderator for this session today. Um, it's our pleasure to deliver this fourth and final session on assessment, evaluation and integrity in online learning. So in this session today, we're going to hear about uh, best practice and some considerations for assessment in an online environment, while also really considering academic integrity, which is a growing concern for, for all educators. So in the session today, we're going to talk about a number of different topics. We're going to be covering alternatives to face-to-face -face assessments that you might need to use in the online environment. We're going to be considering some of the challenges, but also some of the advantages of these non-face types. Uh, we're going to be having a chat about some of the trends in assessment, and particularly in relation to academic integrity, and also considering what educators can do to mitigate against some of these issues. So we have a jam-packed morning or afternoon for you um, that we'd like to share with you. So before we kick off, I'd like to introduce uh, the, the panelists today. So it's my pleasure, first of all, to introduce Dr. Adriana Reyes. Um, Adriana holds a PhD in systems engineering and computer science from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia, a master's in computer science from ULA, and a specialization in teleinformatics from the Universidad Distrital, as well as a systems engineering degree from UFPS. She's a member of the ICT Chamber of Conathis and the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering of the Polytechnic. My apologies if I didn't pronounce any of that correctly. She holds positions as Associate Researcher, Leader of Self-Evaluation and Accreditation Processes, and Researcher of different projects for the incorporation of ICT in the teaching learning process. Welcome to Adriana. I'd also like to introduce my colleague here in the studio with me today. Mr. Riley O'Keefe is the manager of academic integrity here at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, but he also lectures in human resource management. Riley is responsible in his core role for Macquarie University's governance and strategic direction of academic integrity in education and associated initiatives. This includes designing mitigation strategies to protect the institution from the operational and potential reputational risk that might be posed by um, emerging threats, intelligence and contract cheating. Riley is also a professional negotiator and investigative interviewer with over a thousand interviews under his belt, ranging from academic to criminal matters. So welcome, Riley. And I'll briefly just introduce myself before I hand over to, uh, to the embassy to, to introduce the session. So my name is Pamela Humphreys. I'm the director of Macquarie University College, which is the pathway college for Macquarie University here in Sydney, Australia. Um, my background is very much, I was an English language teacher originally, and I've been involved heavily in English language teaching, teacher training, high stakes language assessment, and pathway course delivery um, for over three decades in a range of different countries. Um, I'm a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy, a senior fellow of, the, of IEAA, I'm a TEXA expert, and a board director of NIAS. 
Uh, I publish um, on academic language and learning. And I'm also the director of the English Medium of Instruction Center here at Macquarie University, which is a region first for managing English medium instruction and the challenges around delivering in English um, um, when you're teaching a range of different subjects. So that's the panel. So I'd also like to just introduce now um, Andrea Valencia, who is Senior Policy Manager in the Australian Embassy in Mexico, and she's representing the Australian Department of Education. So over to you, Andrea, to say a few remarks about our session today. No escucho a Andrea. Sí, no estoy escuchando a Andrea. Una disculpa a todos. <risa> eh, un, un, un error de, de 2020. Quitar el mute. Muy buenas tardes a todos y muchas gracias a Pamela por la presentación. Eh, les doy la bienvenida a esta sesión en representación de la consejera Bárbara Kompenhauer y de nuestra oficina que representa al Departamento de Educación de Australia ante los países de la Alianza del Pacífico. Nuestra oficina apoya la colaboración en materia de educación con Colombia en el marco de nuestro memorando de entendimiento. Apoyar una educación superior de calidad, independientemente de la modalidad en la que se imparta, es un objetivo que tanto Australia como Colombia compartimos y que requiere un diálogo constante, una colaboración y un intercambio de buenas prácticas continuos entre gobiernos e instituciones. Durante las últimas cuatro semanas que ha durado esta serie de webinars, hemos tenido varios diálogos que nos han ayudado a profundizar nuestro entendimiento sobre los actuales desafíos, las prácticas y oportunidades para la impartición de la educación superior en línea. Durante la primera sesión, comenzamos estableciendo el escenario en el que se imparte la educación superior en línea, especialmente desde el enfoque de políticas públicas y regulatorias de ambos países para garantizar la calidad eh, en la enseñanza superior en línea. Después, pasamos a las consideraciones que se deben tener en cuenta en las instituciones en el momento de diseñar cursos para que estos cursos sean eh, más eficaces al eh, momento de lograr los resultados de aprendizaje deseados en los estudiantes. La semana pasada, escuchamos perspectivas sobre cómo desarrollar las competencias en los profesores y docentes y en el apoyo eh, para el desarrollo profesional del personal universitario, que ahora debe estar eh, preparado y capacitado no solo para enseñar en persona, sino también uh, en un formato virtual y también híbrido. Por último, el día de hoy hablaremos de la evaluación y de la valoración de los estudiantes. ¿Cómo enfocamos esta eh, evaluación en torno a un... Um, en, en un entorno virtual eh, y en qué se parece y en qué se difieren eh, estas evaluaciones al formato presencial y tradicional. Hemos tenido el placer de coorganizar esta serie de webinars con el Ministerio de Educación Nacional de Colombia, con la consejera Klompenhauer moderando el primer evento, en tanto que nuestros colegas colombianos moderaron el segundo y tercer webinar para que el día de hoy concluyamos con la moderación de un colega australiano una vez más. Para continuar con este webinar, le regreso la palabra a la doctora Pamela Humphreys. Thanks very much, Andrea, for that introduction. So I'll just explain how uh, today's session is going to work. Um, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Adriana Reyes to present her short presentation. Um, and then myself and Riley, we thought we'd do it a little bit differently as a bit of a, a Q&A conversation uh, for the second presentation. 
And then we'll spend the rest of the session where the, the three panelists will discuss a number of questions related to what we've been talking about. And we'll also be addressing some of the questions that you'll be putting in the Q&A along the way. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Dr. Reyes. So over to you, Adriana. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Doctora Pamela. Gracias, Tyler, por acompañarnos y Andrea. Y, y pues al Ministerio y a, y a CONACES y a la Dirección de Calidad por la invitación en este espacio. Eh, vamos a conversar un poquito y rápidamente sobre un tema que, que nos preocupa hoy en día y, y que es muy, eh, es muy evidente la preocupación de los, de los profesores en torno a lo que es cómo evaluar en la educación virtual, ¿cierto? Ese es, es una, un cuestionamiento, una pregunta que, que se hacen hoy en día todos los profesores por eh, el esquema que tenemos de cómo hacer la evaluación y porque tenemos que cambiar ese paradigma de cómo estamos evaluando. Realmente cuando se cambia el contexto, cuando se cambia el medio para, dar, para transmitir el conocimiento, no solamente es cambiar los modelos y las estrategias pedagógicas que se van a incorporar ya sea en un aula virtual, sino también pensar y replantear cómo va a ser esa evaluación. Si no podemos... Eh, our students. So we can't continue to think about assessing knowledge or focus our evaluation in just measuring what level of knowledge the student has acquired. We have to, uh, you know, rethink some aspects. And, and the first one, and one of them is that we need to see what are the skills that uh, we need and, and what is being required in all the different professions to respond to the needs that we see now in the industry 4.0 and the revolution 4.0. And within these skills, we have to focus on the fact that this training that we're providing to our students uh, in our uh, graduation programs at any technical, technological level, professional level, need to be focused on the fact that they need to be able to solve complex problems that may they may see in their professional context. So that they need to have the uh, skills, they need to develop critical thinking that will help them to make decisions. They also need to develop creativity. Although it's true that, um, you know, when uh, we are children, we're quite creative. And then with time, we end up losing this, but we need to continue to foster creativity regardless of the profession. Not necessarily do we, they should only be applicable to the arts, right? But esa, esa creatividad. Eh, trabajar mucho la inteligencia emocional. Esto es fundamental para tener profesionales exitosos y que le aporten a las, a las empresas o a su sector donde se vayan a desempeñar. Y también el desarrollo de la flexibilidad cognitiva. Estas, estas competencias que estoy enunciando acá, estas cinco, eh, son fundamentales y cuando definamos o planteamos los resultados de aprendizaje de los programas, tenemos que pensar que esos resultados de aprendizaje tienen que contribuir al logro de que estas personas, de que estos futuros profesionales logren, alcancen y puedan desarrollar a lo largo de su vida estas competencias para llegar a ser unos profesionales exitosos y que realmente le aporten al medio y a la, y a la sociedad. Y entonces, si pensamos en que tenemos que desarrollar estas competencias en ellos, tenemos que replantear la forma como los vamos a evaluar. Si nosotros estamos hablando de un contexto de una educación en línea, eh, eh, la duda y, y la inquietud siempre surge en torno a, de que, a cuando voy a evaluar esos conocimientos o cuando voy a hacer una evaluación tipo test, ¿cómo garantizo que no haya un plagio? ¿Cierto? ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo hago para garantizar que sí es el estudiante el que me está contestando sin estar mirando o consultando en otro lado, sin estarse enviando las respuestas con sus compañeros? Entonces, ahí es donde debemos pensar, ¿por qué tengo que hacer ese tipo de evaluación? ¿Por qué no evaluamos de otra forma? ¿Sí? ¿Por qué tengo que preocuparme en poner todos los trucos, en cambiar preguntas aleatorias, en mirar cómo planteo el, mi, mi test o mi cuestionario, si no debo pensar es no me sirve ese tipo de evaluación, de pronto la puedo aplicar en algunos aspectos, pero no debe ser el centro, sino debo que tengo que replantear cómo hacer esa evaluación. Y al replantearla es cuando tenemos que pensar que la evaluación no la podemos dejar para el momento final, para evaluar ya todo el conocimiento que de pronto le he, 
le he aportado a un estudiante o que él ha desarrollado en su proceso, sino que yo tengo que hacer una evaluación que, que vaya siendo también eh, progresiva a lo largo de todo el proceso formativo. Y es cuando entonces empieza, debemos pensar en otras estrategias como son las intervenciones. ¿Cómo planteamos en un aula eh, de clase virtual una situación de un caso real donde el estudiante pueda intervenir, pueda plantear, pueda desarrollar críticamente una posición, un pensamiento frente a un contexto que se plantea de una situación real? ¿Cómo planteamos estudios de caso donde ya se analiza todo un procedimiento y un proceso que él debe seguir para dar solución a ese caso? ¿Cómo planteamos proyectos de aula donde también desarrollamos habilidades blandas como el trabajo colaborativo, el liderazgo, donde ese proyecto no sea solamente desarrollado por una persona, sino por un grupo de estudiantes, donde cada uno desde sus fortalezas aporte a la construcción de esa solución? ¿Y cómo vamos mirando progresivamente ese trabajo colaborativo, ese liderazgo, ese aporte de cada uno en el desarrollo de esa solución, no esperar a la solución final, sino ir mirando el avance, ir evaluando ese progreso. Pensar en la evaluación teórica, porque sin embargo habrá momentos donde requerimos mirar ese nivel de conocimiento, pero pensar las estrategias de cómo la puedo hacer también de, de forma oral, ¿sí?, teniendo una entrevista, teniendo una conversación, realizando unas preguntas abiertas a un estudiante y que él me plantee sus puntos de vista, sus opiniones frente a esos conceptos. Y también pensar en cómo él va documentando todo su proceso a través de una estrategia como la que se denomina el e-portafolio, ¿sí? la consolidación y el, el ir registrando, ir llevando todo su avance a través de un portafolio electrónico que será una bitácora de todas las actividades que él va a ir desarrollando. Entonces es cuando nosotros debemos pensar en que ya el proceso de, digamos, de evaluación no debemos centrarlo solamente en contenidos, sino que tenemos que centrarlo en una serie de actividades donde la evaluación es algo necesario en todo el proceso de enseñanza-aprendizaje. Han surgido muchos modelos, estrategias pedagógicas, pero la evaluación es la que más se ha quedado estancada, es la que de pronto no ha evolucionado de la mano con todas estas estrategias que hemos incorporado en el, au en el aula. Y debemos pensar esa evaluación eh, como un proceso de valoración sistemática, que no lo podemos dejar para un momento final, sino que tiene que partir desde el inicio, acompañado de esas actividades donde vamos recogiendo datos de estos estudiantes, de su progreso, donde los vamos analizando, donde podemos emitir unos juicios de valor a partir de esa información y donde podemos tomar decisiones porque debemos mirar que la evaluación y todo el proceso de enseñanza-aprendizaje debemos centrarlo es en nuestros estudiantes y cómo él ha ido apropiando estos conocimientos. Entonces, eh, digamos que no solamente es preocuparnos por cómo tomamos esa información, sino que y cómo el alumno recuerda ciertos conocimientos, sino que realmente tenemos es que formar a estos estudiantes para que él pueda adquirir sus conocimientos, para que él pueda transformarlos, para que ese proceso de formación no se centre en el profesor, sino se centre en el estudiante, donde ese estudiante debe pasar de ser un receptor a ser un desarrollador. Y ese proceso de ser un desarrollador es lo que nosotros vamos a ir evidenciando y vamos a ir haciendo seguimiento para esa valoración o esa evaluación que vamos a hacer de los estudiantes, donde esos entornos formativos deben pasar de, de, también de ser unos receptores a estar participando e interactuando entre ellos. Donde tenemos que centrarnos es en el desempeño y la competencia que va alcanzando nuestros estudiantes y dejar de pensar en la evaluación como una evaluación sumativa y realmente pensar en lo que es una evaluación auténtica. Y donde la interactividad y todas las herramientas que nos ofrece el entorno online también nos van a permitir eh, desarrollar y que el estudiante pueda mostrar y trabajar interactivamente y aplicarlas en su proceso de formación. Entonces, es muy importante que se genere ese aprendizaje y que esa evaluación se convierta realmente en una evaluación auténtica, que básicamente es cuando vamos a mirar directamente el desempeño de esas tareas que el estudiante va desarrollando cuando el estudiante tiene que interpretar sus conocimientos, los conocimientos que ha adquirido, 
puede eh, tomar unas posiciones, unos puntos de vista, argumentar y de esa manera podemos el estudiante puede demostrar su desempeño y su apropiación de ese conocimiento. Entonces, es, digamos, centrarnos en, en analizar ese desempeño de ese estudiante, cómo todas estas actividades que les ponemos en los entornos virtuales los llevan a pensar creativamente a transformar su conocimiento y a, a enfrentarse a desafíos y a proporcionar oportunidades donde ellos pueden plantear unas posibles soluciones. Entonces, digamos que ahí está el reto en esta transformación que tenemos que hacer un poco de la, de la evaluación eh, en el contexto de los programas online o de los programas híbridos que tienen, digamos, apoyo también por las tecnologías. Vamos, ah, perdón, que se me quedó por aquí como bloqueado. Tenemos también entonces que pensar en que todo esto lo podemos lograr si eh, para la definición de las estrategias de evaluación, estas tienen que estar coordinadas y alineadas con lo que se busca en la carrera, con los resultados de aprendizaje definidos para la carrera. Tenemos que capacitar a nuestros docentes en todo lo que son estas estrategias de evaluación de acuerdo a los cursos y al resultado de aprendizaje y a la competencia que se pretenda desarrollar se, y a la estrategia de aula. Se define el tipo de evaluación, se hace el diseño de, la, de evaluación y se comunica a los alumnos cómo va a ser su evaluación. Eh, si nosotros diseñamos una rúbrica, si nosotros diseñamos un instrumento, darlo a conocer a los estudiantes para que ellos sepan de qué forma se va a llevar a cabo esa evaluación. Entonces, eso digamos son algunos de los planteamientos que tenemos que, que hacernos para transformar un poco y realmente sí tener un impacto y digamos, seguir hablando de la calidad de la educación, pero también en el contexto de los programas virtuales o de los programas híbridos. Gracias, Pamela. Thanks very much, Anne. And uh, Riley and I were nodding all the way through that, completely agreeing with everything that you said. And it really resonates with some of the things that we're going to discuss in the second presentation as well. So thanks so much for outlining, um, outlining the theoretical and then some very practical ways that that could be implemented. Um, so we'll move on to the second segment where myself and Riley are going to discuss some of the, the same uh, topics that you've just covered, Adriana, in a slightly different way. Um, so one of the, the topics that we wanted to, to start with was alternatives to face-to-face -face assessments, because you need alternatives when you're operating in an online or in a hybrid context. So um, I guess if we start with some of the, the tr very traditional forms of assessment, we probably relied quite a lot on traditional exams and traditional in-class uh, assessment tasks. Um, and probably during COVID, it was where we had to make some very rapid changes to move to having every assessment task um, out of necessity. We had to deliver that um, in a non-face-to-face -face, um, uh, method, delivery mode. So let, let's talk first of all about so, what some of the alternatives to face-to-face -face assessments are. And I know that Adriana um, just mentioned a few like e-portfolios and case studies. Um, would you like to mention a few more, Riley? that um, are, co are common, that are non-face-to-face? Non Absolutely. So even before like, uh, COVID um, came to us, Macquarie University um, had a lot of online assessment options um, throughout our curriculum here. Um, and these can be asynchronous or synchro uh, synchronous assessment items as well. Uh, some of those include uh, essays uh, and reports, which can be submitted through uh, Turnitin, for example, which is a plagiarism detection software. We have also had a range of presentations using presentaciones usando eh, recordings. We also have a lot of um, uh, online quizzes as well. 
which can be auto-marked through our learning management system. Mm -hmm. So there's a wide range of a uh, portfolio of online assessments that can help uh, with the student's learning journey. Yeah. Um, I guess a few things that became more common during uh, COVID in particular was online invigilated exams um, and especially open book exams. So a very different kind of exam. It's still an exam, but it's an open book. And um, we might talk a little bit about that down the track. Um, discussion forum posts, um, Viva Voce, so an oral presentation, um, and perhaps these became more common uh, during, during COVID. Um, but as you said, Riley, these, these have always existed, and perhaps it was COVID that increased that number, but it really got us thinking about alternatives to these traditional face-to-face -face assessments. Mm. Absolutely, it did. So based on that, uh, were there any ramifications, maybe uh, using that COVID environment um, as an example, were there any ramifications from transitioning so quickly from face-to-face -face assessment items to the online environment? Um, and if there were, what, what were they? Yeah, I think because during COVID it was an emergency response, we had to move really quickly, like you said, and that ha had a huge impact on our, our teaching staff. Um, but that's because the content and the assessments were designed for face-to-face -face delivery. And suddenly we were delivering online. Now, that's not best practice, and that's not how we'll be moving forward. So in the future, what we need to do is ensure, just as Adriana said, we need to make sure that we design the assessments for the delivery mode. Does work is creating something for a face-to-face -face, uh, delivery mode and then deciding to put it online. So that's not best practice. It's, you can't retrofit it. And that was the challenge during COVID. So initially there, are, there were workload challenges. But I think going forward, um, what we need to do is, is exactly what Adriana just said. It's about a rethink of the kinds of assessment tasks that are going to be useful in this delivery mode. For example, as I just mentioned, an open book exam. Now, an open book exam means the students can refer to the resources, any resources that are available to them. And that means that you've got to write the task in a very different way than if it was closed book, because it's not about testing knowledge, remembering. It's not about cramming or memorizing or rote learning. And it's not about surface learning. So what we're trying to do in good assessments and an open book, if it's written well, can be a good assessment to uh, assess deep learning and encourage deep learning rather than surface learning. So I think that um, lecturers and, and educators generally might need more support to be able to learn how to design assessment tasks for this kind of environment. So I think that actually what COVID did was make us consider good assessment design. Um, we, couldn't, we couldn't get away with a, a, a quick and dirty exam. We had to give it some really much more considered thought. We have to consider the design. We have to consider, as Adriana mentioned, critical thinking. And there's a few key phrases here that I want to bring up, and that's assurance of learning. It's all about assuring that our students have learned, and it's not just about demonstrating uh, rote memorizing. So ass assessment for learning rather than assessment of learning, I think is an important shift. Um, I mentioned it's not just about leaving all of the assessment to the end, but that we have some formative assessment as well as summative assessment, that we focus on process, not just product, mm -hmm. and that we assess students on the process as well as the product um, along the way. So I think I think it's um, a number of things changed as a result of COVID. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So let's move on now to talk about some of the challenges and advantages that non face to face assessments can bring. So let, let's start with challenges, uh, Riley. What what challenges do you think that um, non face to face assessments can bring beyond the design issue? So uh, non-face-to-face assessment items or online assessment items definitely do bring a wide range um, of challenges and issues with them, um, especially surrounding assessment security and academic integrity as well. 
um, in person or face to face do have academic integrity issues and assessment security issues. Um, but in the online environment, they look a little bit different and they act a little bit different as well. Um, so some of this, some systems uh, can be implemented, um, for example, such as Turnitin, uh, which is plagiarism detection software. Um, we could also, I guess, uh, nut out some of the uh, confusions with assessment items instructions as well. So when, for example, we have uh, and are working in the online environment, um, our assessment item instructions to students may get confusing. Um, we may be short or we as academics know exactly what we are talking about, but we may not be able to convey that correctly or appropriately. Um, to the students in a manner to which they understand the terms that online assessment items can bring. Um, there is a lot of notion around um, other students completing the work themselves with the online assessment items. Um, I like to think as educational providers that we are giving the students the opportunity um, and trust as well to be able to complete those assessment items um, and giving them the education and the tools and the equipment and the resources to do so. Um, but despite that, I do think that uh, non face to face assessment items or online assessment items can bring some advantages. Um, some advantages may include the increase of the student experience. Um, so, for example, um, design can be made in such a way where it's flexible and it's timely, so the students can complete an assessment item in their own time rather than at a set time, um, which really assists ability as well. Um, so students can juggle the many things that are being thrown at them uh, as a student, I guess, at the moment. Um, it gives them more control as well of independent learning. Um, so giving students the autonomy to learn. We provide the education and they can determine how best they learn and take the steering wheel into their own education. Um, so it also forces us as educators uh, to bring and select a different profile of assessment types as well, which gets quite creative and makes the learning and teaching environment fun and exciting. It's not all about the uh, exams, which can be quite stressful. Um, and assessing students along their learning journey rather than right at the end um, is something that's pretty important um, that can be implemented with online events as well. Um, uh, so with that, Pamela, do you have anything to add on top of that? Yeah, look, I completely agree. And um, I'm just thinking about your comment about being more kind of creative in assessment design. I was reflecting on something that we did for our English language students. And traditionally in English language, we've always assessed each of the what we call the skills of reading, writing, listening and speaking completely separately. And during COVID, we thought that partly from the creative perspective, partly from the plagiarism perspective, one way to mitigate that was actually to have integrated skill assessment. So rather than assessing separately, we would give students a reading to do or some listening to do, and then we would assess what they'd read and what they'd listened through a speaking or a writing exam. And in that way, we knew that they were doing the work. Um, perhaps Tal vez estamos, estaban haciendo una presentación en directo, en vivo, a tiempo real, eh, de forma, así que nos volvimos bastante creativos, ¿no? Con estos exámenes. Y antes no lo hacíamos. Y también tienes razón que esto obliga a los educadores a que realmente apliquen las mejores prácticas, en vez de solamente usar un examen el, al final del curso, ¿no? Nos hace pensar. Sobre qué podemos hacer a lo largo del caso. Let's talk about academic integrity, Riley, because I know that's your area of expertise. And you're, you're actually the manager of academic integrity at the university. And it's quite amazing that academic integrity has become such a major issue that we have somebody whose full time job is to take care of that at the university. Um, 
So I wanted to ask you, what kind of trends are you seeing with academic integrity or dishonesty? Absolutely. Um, so there's a wide range, I guess, of uh, problems, um, but also uh, some solutions as well um, that a full-time employee such as myself are uh, focused on everybody can bring to the table. I also think it's really important to mention that some issues with academic integrity and assessment item security may be discipline specific. So the academic integrity issues, for example, in the arts discipline or creative performance discipline may very well be different or look different uh, to those in science disciplines or engineering disciplines, for example. So uh, across the board, what we're seeing at the moment, and definitely in the Australian context, is a big decline of plagiarism issues. Um, I think our education around plagiarism um, is quite robust at the moment. Uh, plagiarism is being taught in uh, secondary schools and high schools as well, so in addition to tertiary education sectors. But what we are seeing as well, and it is one of the issues that online um, and non-face-to-face -face assessment items bring, is the rise of contract cheating. Cheating is where a student, whether they pay uh, for it or not, it gets someone else to complete their assessment for them and then submits their own. And now that causes quite catastrophic effects for learning um, because that's not the student's learning. How can we assure that the student um, uh, has the required knowledge they need to go out into the workforce and say that they have successfully completed this degree as well? Um, so international students, so when international students from other countries come to Australia, and they are particularly more vulnerable um, because they may have different learning systems in their home country. So, for example, there are a lot of Asian countries that praise and teach rote learning, which is copying information and then pasting it directly into an assignment as the correct answer. Whereas our education system over here um, and emphasises critical thinking um, and bringing in new and fresh ideas based off the information that is already there uh, and available. Um, so paraphrasing as well is um, a challenge that uh, definitely presents through academic integrity, especially with international students. Um, we also have, um, and that's probably the very hot topic of the room at the moment, is artificial intelligence, where it's a generative artificial intelligence. Uh, so software platforms that can automatically write a student's essay or assignment as well. Um, so I'm sure that the universities in Australia are not the only universities in the world that are struggling with this issue right now. So I really think it's important that we come together um, as allies um, across ponds to be able to critically on how obsessed um, online learning with the new challenges presented as well. Um, do you have anything to add there? Sure. I think one of the things that we're very concerned about here at Macquarie, and I think it's not it's not just here, is that if students are not doing the work, that this can be a real compromise on the credential and also the brand of the university. So this is a real reputational risk. And I know that we've been working very hard on it here at Macquarie. I just wondered you might want to make a couple of comments about our recent Academic Integrity Week, which you and your team led. Absolutely. So Academic Integrity Week, um, which we put on the same week as the International Day of Action Against Contract Cheating, uh, was a week here at Macquarie where we had in-person and online uh, webinars and seminars um, for a variety of different academic integrity topics, um, such as contract cheating, uh, such as firing. Uh, we also had presentations on assessment design and learning outcome design uh, to assist our academics and our students better understand the topic um, and also ensure its importance as well throughout the student journey uh, here at Macquarie. It was really quite successful, actually. Uh, we had over 1,200 participants across both our staff and student portfolios. 
Um, and that was just one way that we could um, promote, I guess, the ideology of academic integrity and what it means to us here at Macquarie University. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Riley. And I notice in the chat um, that uh, we've shared some of uh, Riley's very long list of recommended readings around particularly chat GPT, but also the these issues um, that you've just been outlining. So you might be interested in reading some of those some of those articles. Pamela, I might throw back to you if that's okay. As a leader here at Macquarie University, um, how do you think educators might mitigate some of these risks um, that have been highlighted uh, earlier this morning? Yeah, well, Adriana started to, to mention some of those earlier. And I think, I think the first thing is we have to accept we cannot eliminate all of this completely. But by good design um, and by having a varied assessment profile, we can do that so that we're not just relying on a single exam, for example. So some of the things that we can do is, as Adriana mentioned, authentic assessment. Another way is personalized assessment. So I know that in our at the college where we have um, maths and statistics um, exams, we have unique generated assessments for each student. Um, so they assess the same task, but using different numbers. So unique, unique generated um, assessments, um, and we use student ID or auto generate. Um, another thing we do, and Adriana mentioned this earlier, randomized questions. If you have a large enough item bank, I know it takes work, but if you are able to randomize your questions, that will reduce uh, these challenges. Um, as a language teacher, um, um, we found that if you put more marks on the draft than the final version of the essay, then you encourage students to, to um, uh, get involved in the process. And you know your students, whether they were capable of making the difference between what you saw in the draft and what you saw in the final version. So that's another way of, of mitigating against that. And exactly as Adriana mentioned earlier, matching assessments with employability skills is critical um, for the future, future-focused, um, assessing critical thinking, and ultimately, I'm returning to what I said earlier, which is ultimately we're interested in assuring uh, learning. So I think that's that's critical. So I did mention the elephant in the room earlier, chat GPT, and there's a lot of concern about that regarding the possible impact on assessments. Um, we did talk a little bit about it, but did you want to make any final comments about chat GPT? Yeah, wow. What a very hot topic yeah. at the moment this is. Um, uh, whilst uh, I guess the academic integrity environment um, has been struggling with generative artificial intelligence technologies uh, for a while now, I think uh, chat GPT definitely uh, put it in the spotlight um, as a massive issue and concern that something needs to be addressed and considered. So here at Macquarie University, we have convened a control group uh, across a wide range of uh, portfolios and disciplines um, to assist what uh, the effects of artificial intelligence means for that discipline. And together as a community, um, and provide some solutions uh, to help staff and students better understand uh, what some of the ramifications can be in regards to this. Um, the main emphasis I think we're putting on here at the university in regards to generative artificial intelligence is to provide students with the tools and equipment to be able to make ethical decisions when it comes to the use of artificial intelligence. So getting them to uh, query and uh, analyze and assess, where is this information coming from? How do I know that this information is correct? Where can I go to confirm that this information is correct? Are some of the questions that we really encourage our students to think about before um, entering into a generative artificial intelligence platform. Um, uh, so with that, Pamela, um, did you want to maybe discuss uh, some of the things as well, such as a harm minimization approach um, in terms of 
how we as uh, leaders, and I think I touched a little bit before, uh, on it before um, in that ethical environment, um, but do you have any ideas or maybe suggestions on what we could do as educators uh, to really help students um, in the learning environment when it comes to the use of artificial intelligence? Um, I think everything that you've just said, it's making sure that students are educated so that they can make good decisions. Um, and I think one of the things that we've really decided to do at Macquarie is to not rush back into um, back into making everything a final summative exam and paper based. And there is a it, there is a temptation to do that. And I think we have to understand what is good assessment, good assessment design for online, for hybrid, for face to face and make good decisions, um, support students to make good decisions. Um, I think it's a it's a multi pronged approach. I think yeah. to ensuring that that we're supporting students through this. I think the main emphasis is well is uh, going back to what we've discussed originally. We cannot um, kind of transition non face to face exams uh, from a face to face environment. We really need to critically assess what we want the students to learn and how we're going to assess that as educators as well. So, and as Adriana mentioned, half of it can be knowledge-based. So uh, sure, they definitely understand that information, but also assessing the soft skills learned as well, which will assist through um, employability, such as technical skills, communication skills, personal skills, and emotional intelligence as well, which is becoming quite a fundamental I guess, um, soft skill that's needed uh, throughout employment. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. Well, I think that kind of concludes our section. So I'm going to move straight away into the questions. And Adriana, I have a question for you in the chat. Um, the question from one of our participants, what is the expected impact of artificial intelligence in the Colombian online learning environment? And how is evaluation going to change as a result of that? So I'll stop there and then unpack the next part in a moment. So the expected impact of AI in Colombia, in your view? Bueno, eh, yo creo que tenemos el mismo temor que planteaba ahorita Ryler también de que todo es el mismo temor que tienen todos los, los profesores a nivel mundial, ¿no? Con, con plata, con, digamos, como algo como chat realmente ahí lo que tenemos que afrontar y, y lo que tenemos que plantear es esa posición ética y crítica de nuestros estudiantes. Yo digo que ahí está la clave que ahorita lo, lo decía él, es decirle y mostrarles esto existe, esto lo pueden usar, esto está ahí, pero ¿cómo verificas que lo que te está diciendo es, es lo, lo real? ¿Cómo verificas que esa información sí es válida? Puede ser que presenten un ensayo, un escrito sacado de allí, pero ven cómo lo interpretas. Tú traes esto, lo hiciste, pero tu posición, tu punto de vista frente a esto, si cambiamos esto en ese contexto, ¿qué puede suceder? Entonces yo creo que es más, de pronto, no podemos ocultarlo, no podemos prohibirlo. Desde, así lo prohibamos, por algún lado van a acceder a todas estas plataformas y lo que debemos es mirar cómo sacamos provecho de ellas para mejorar los procesos al interior de nuestros programas y de nuestras instituciones. Eh, no solamente de, de plataformas como esta de inteligencia artificial, sino también de tecnologías. Las tecnologías de realidad aumentada son tecnologías que podemos aprovechar mu muchísimo en los entornos de programas online o virtuales eh, a través de, de simuladores a través de herramientas que permitan generar eh, prototipos o generar eh, diferentes modelos y, y debemos es aprovecharlas. Lo que tenemos que empezar a hacer más énfasis y crear la cultura, desde lo decían ahorita, inclusive desde la secundaria, es a que los muchachos no se centren solamente en mirar cómo buscan hacer la trampa para entregar sus tareas, sino que empiecen a desarrollar su, su pensamiento crítico y que realmente se, dan cuen, se den cuenta que eh, al acceder o al hacer las trampas, los perjudicados son, son ellos mismos. Son ellos mismos porque al, 
al cursar una profesión, al hacer todo esto, cuando salgan, pues de pronto no se van a emplear fácilmente, no van a tener los conocimientos que se requieren, no van a alcanzar las competencias que se esperan. Entonces no se trata, como decía ahorita eh, Pamela, de, de correr, se trata de hacer un proceso serio, consciente, y, y es lo que tenemos que empezar a crear en la cultura de nuestros chicos desde muy pequeños, que tengan un pensamiento crítico, que den respuestas a los problemas que se presentan y que todas las herramientas están para usarse, que las aprovechen, pero para su beneficio y para su crecimiento y su conocimiento, ¿no? Yeah, thanks, Adriana. There was a second part to that question, um, and it was what institutional regulation do you think will be implemented as a result of this, if any? Bueno, hay muchas herramientas también para verificar lo del plagio está que, que utilizamos en, en muchas de nuestras instituciones para verificar cuánto se toman de otros lugares, para... Eh, mirar el nivel o, la, o el porcentaje que se ha tomado de otros, de otros sitios sin ser referenciados, pero, pero digamos que independientemente si se tienen las plataformas de inteligencia artificial o no, eh, podremos encontrar que, tienen, que, que, que los estudiantes tienden a, a copiar cuando entregan eh, trabajos o documentos, ¿no? o buscar o no citar adecuadamente. Entonces, yo creo que lo que tenemos que llevarlos y plantear eh, actividades en los, en los espacios sincrónicos o en los encuentros, más de, más de reflexión y de cuál es tu, pues, tu punto de vista, eh, ya sea a través de encuentros sincrónicos o de videos o de posiciones frente a problemas o frente a casos. Entonces, de pronto es mirar un poco más eso ya la parte de entregar el documento sin una sustentación o una explicación, solo un informe, yo creo que tenemos que replantearlo. Thanks, Adriana. I'm going to ask you, Riley, do you want to comment on that as well from the Australian or the Macquarie perspective? Absolutely. So in addition to what um, Adriana just mentioned, I also think it's really critical Uh, that we teach students and help them understand um, what the definitions of human reliance on such technologies mean um, and kind of get them to critically assess um, in terms of obviously knowing the knowledge that we're teaching, but also making sure that students aren't relying on these technologies. So for example, if we uh, chucked our hands up and said, oh yes, every student can now use chat GPT, that's fine. We're going to change um, and we're going to stop educating, have fun. Well, what happens if the internet goes out? What happens if your computer turns off? Uh, where are you going to turn to then? How are you going to know the correct answer? So whilst I do think it's important Um, to teach uh, students about the ethics and where uh, their decision making is coming from, as Adriana touched on. I also think it's uh, equally as important um, to let students know and become aware of the risks associated uh, with human dependence on such technologies as well. Yep. Okay, thanks. We've got another question here. This is from Gustavo. He says, how can traditional evaluation or assessment change so that in the online learning environment, these evaluations and assessments can incentivize complex learning or deep learning. So Adriana, I don't know if you want to that one first. How can the design change so that we incentivize deep learning? And you've, you've touched on this already, I think. Sí, sí, tenemos que ir a eso, a incentivar otro tipo de, de análisis y reflexiones y eh, tenemos que pensar en el diseño de rúbricas para la evaluación. Eh, es, una, es, es un instrumento muy válido y, y muy pertinente en los contextos de, de los programas virtuales online. Eh, cuando diseñamos una rúbrica, se la presentamos al estudiante, le damos claramente cuál es el objetivo que se busca con ese trabajo que él va a desarrollar, qué es lo que los criterios de desempeño que esperamos que él, que él alcance, que él logre, eh, cuáles son los niveles que él puede alcanzar y que bajo eso es que le vamos a, a evaluar. Digamos que 
que le da la claridad a él de cómo también afrontar y presentar sus actividades y, su, y, su, y desarrollar su evaluación. Cuando pensamos en el contexto de las evaluaciones, eh, digamos, de teóricas o de contenidos a través de los, de los test, pues tenemos diferentes estrategias como lo, lo manifestábamos ahorita de esas, de esas preguntas aleatorias, de preguntar de pronto, hacer preguntas cerradas, pero con el punto de la explicación, si escoges esto, ¿por qué? Argumenta, da tu punto de vista, ¿por qué consideras que esa es la respuesta que seleccionaste? Entonces, no quedarnos solamente en, en el marcar eh, la respuesta, sino en argumentar el por qué se selecciona esa respuesta. Y yo creo que eh, a eso, al, al incluir esta parte de, de la reflexión, del punto de vista del... Eh, estamos haciéndolos o poniéndolos a pensar un poquito, un poquito más, que no solamente es eh, grabarse el, el contenido o consultar la respuesta, sino bueno, es, si es esta, y yo sé que es esa, pero bueno, ¿cómo la voy a explicar o cómo la voy a argumentar ¿no? como estudiante? Entonces, eh, digamos que son cosas que nos llevan, eh, Pamela decía ahorita, es de pronto un trabajo más pesado para, para nosotros los profes, no, es que pero, bien, pero tenemos que... que proponernos y, y replantearnos esas estrategias de evaluación. Absolutely. I'm just picking up on some of the things that you're saying there, Adriana, about justifying, and it reminded me of, um, I don't know if it's popular in Colombia, but in Australia we use Bloom's taxonomy, which is that the list of difficulty in the or higher order thinking skills So at the top, you've got justification and evaluation sí. and analysis. And at the bottom, you've got basic things like understanding and remembering. I'm not sure if you refer to the same mm -hmm. framework or you have something similar in, in, in Colombia. But when we're designing um, assessments, we have to make sure um, in order to incentivize, mm -hmm. going back to Gustavo's question, to incentivize students to, for deep learning, we have to consider where we are on that tax. Um, according to the students you're teaching, of course, because postgrads you're going to expect mm -hmm. higher than undergrads. Um, I don't know, Adriana, if you want to, to talk ahorita, about that. I don't know the, the taxonomy. Sí, yeah. sí ahorita en, en Colombia con la incorporación de los resultados de aprendizaje, digamos que en la parte normativa eh, se incorporó que los programas deben definir sus resultados de aprendizaje. Muchas instituciones eh, se han basado en la taxonomía de Bloom para hacer esa definición y también de acuerdo a ciertos cursos, habrán unos cursos donde son como introductorios, donde de pronto están en esos niveles más bajos, donde dan los conocimientos, dan las teorías y habrán otros cursos donde ya estarán en unos niveles más altos, donde es la aplicación, la reflexión, el análisis. Entonces, en esa línea cognitiva que nos plantea Blum, me parece que, que también teniendo en cuenta esto, se pueden definir los diferentes tipos de evaluación y las estrategias de cómo los evaluamos. Por eso al principio, pues decía, tenemos que pensar en que se tiene que dar esa articulación de, de esas competencias que esperamos que desarrollar en nuestros estudiantes y deben estar articuladas con esos resultados de aprendizaje, pensar en qué estrategias de aula, pero las estrategias tienen que estar de la mano con, con la evaluación. No podemos seguir con la misma evaluación si estamos pensando en un entorno virtual o, o, en un ent o en un entorno que va a ser híbrido para la formación. Tenemos que pensar en cómo replantear esos, esa evaluación. Y yo creo que esa también tenemos que llevarla a la presencialidad. ¿sí? Eh, cosas y ventajas que nos trajo la pandemia, tenemos no que perderlas, sino seguirlas incorporando y aplicando en nuestros programas también en modalidades presenciales. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's not to say that there's anything wrong with assessing at the bottom. Sometimes you do need to check if students understra understand, um, but we do need to think about where what it is where we're asking students to do. Did you want to add anything to that, Riley? I think it, another good way or a way to uh, really assess or make sure that the student, I guess, is uh, learning the content space assignments um, is to get them to bring their own ideas on the issue Uh, to the table and assess them on the own ideas that they have. Um, so, for example, you could get students to look at one research paper, for example, and then look at another research paper that contradicts what the first research paper says, and then get them to draw their own collusion, um, their own conclusions, um, and synergize what both of those articles are saying. So I think maybe that's uh, another tip as well 
um, into how we can assure both learning, um, but also make the learning environment fun for students as well, where they get the opportunity to showcase their knowledge. Yeah, and um, as you were talking there, it was reminding me of going back to the key principles of assessment, uh, which are validity, reliability, practice, and these, I mean, lots of others as well, but these three are often the, the three core principles, and they're sometimes in tension. So often as educators, we think it'll be very quick and very practical and very reliable to create a multiple choice question and a final exam. Done and dusted, quick, easy. But that's perhaps not the most valid way of assessing what we're interested in finding out. So I think it, it's also important to go back to those uh, initial principles. Um, I have another question here in the chat. It says, beyond ethics, argumentative skills, analytical skills that have been mentioned, what other skills, if any, do you think students should acquire to face the 4.0 revolution? So this is a good, good question. And picking up on what you were talking about before, Adriana, these key skills. Do you think hybrid online learning modality and the and evaluation that we currently use is facilitating acquiring, acquiring those skills? So let's Let's go back to what, what are the skills, and you've, you've mentioned it a couple of times, Adriana. What are the competencies and the skills that students are going to need to respond to the 4.0 revolution? So, so over to you, Adriana. Sí, yo creo que, bueno, ahí ya, ya mencionaban una de las habilidades comunicativas y el, el trabajo colaborativo, el, el liderazgo. El liderazgo es, es clave que... No todos pues tienen esa capacidad, pero es importante que la desarrollen. Eh, y, la, y el pensamiento crítico, lo, lo, lo hemos manifestado los, los tres, realmente los, las profesiones tienden a cambiar con la incorporación de todas las tecnologías y lo que nos trae. Eh, yo digo que no es tanto que desaparezcan, es que se transformen muchas de las profesiones que hay. Eh, yo creo que no es de asustarse que van a desaparecer, que ya no se necesitarán profesores, no se necesitarán abogados, que porque ya todo lo hace la, la inteligencia artificial, no. Yo creo que es de, de que las, los, los futuros profesionales ya van a tener otro enfoque y tienen que desarrollar esas habilidades de, de pensamiento crítico y de, de que no tengan en las organizaciones, en las empresas, que des, decirles qué, qué es lo que deben hacer, sino que sean las personas que propongan soluciones ante lo que se se presenten las organizaciones. Entonces, es más como de, de ser esas personas eh, críticas, creativas, reflexivas y que propongan alternativas de solución. Dejar un poco la parte mecánica, operativa, sino aprovechar y aprender a manejar las tecnologías para toma de decisiones y mejorar procesos en todos los, los ámbitos y los contextos. Creo que eso es clave. Y la, y la parte híbrida, Yo considero que la formación híbrida sí permite que los estudiantes desarrollen ciertas competencias que de pronto los van a los van a hacer más más competentes en lo que nos está marcando la industria 4.0. Mire que los muchas profesiones ya lo hacen a través del teletrabajo. Eh, eh, los chicos tienen que empezar a desarrollar más sus habilidades de ser autodidactas, de de aprender a través de plataformas, de identificar lo que hablábamos ahorita, su, su ética y lo que las herramientas le, le brindan para, para sacar, su pro, sacar provecho, pero, pero siempre pensando en mejorar y en aprender. Entonces considero que brinda unas ventajas y unas oportunidades que debemos aprovechar. De pronto hay ciertos niveles de formación en los cuales se tendría que pensar y en ciertas profesiones, pero hay otras en las cuales se puede aprovechar mucho. Yeah, um, I think there, there are some disciplines and some professions where clearly there's a body of knowledge that has to be learned that is fixed. Medicine, for example. But there are many professions and the emerging professions where what they learn at university is going to be out of date in a couple of years' time. Take IT as a very obvious example and learning. So it's absolutely critical that students learn skills that are future focused. So the problem solve, the critical thinking. Did you want to add any other competencies to that, Riley? Absolutely. No, I definitely like to highlight and put emphasis on problem solving skills as well. And I think we as educators can definitely uh, help students 
and give them uh, the, the thinking practice behind uh, problem solving skills. I know I love as a manager when my employees come to me and I'm sure you can agree with a problem and a solution. So I really, really highlight um, and praise uh, when my employees can um, give me um, some tangible work with and we can actually have that critical debate and discussion to go forth and then properly solve that issue no matter what it is. So, of course, knowledge is that requirement um, that is also those soft skills as well, um, such as problem solving, I guess, and the to be able to think and predict problems that may occur in the future uh, to mitigate those issues as well. So I think goes boarding and smoothly, yeah. You're absolutely right that the soft skills are as critical as hard skills. In fact, I think there's um, some people think that soft skills is actually the worm because they're not soft at all. They're absolutely critical. Um, but there, there is often that kind of division between the hard and the soft skills. Um, I have a question um, in the chat from Hector. Um, what follow up strategies can be applied? to identify if the online student is appropriating their learner role. I'm not sure what, what you mean there, Hector. I'm, I'm a, if I must identify that the student is who they say they are. I'll, I'll assume that that's what you mean. Uh, Adriana, are you able to, to answer that question? I don't know if you can see the original question in Spanish there in the Q&A. Sí, sí. Sí, yo creo que ese proceso de seguimiento es, es clave, lo que decíamos, como que no dejar o pensar que la evaluación siempre tiene que ser al final para evaluar los, todos los conocimientos, o, sino ir en ciertas etapas. Y cuando hablamos o cuando aplicamos, eh, digamos, metodologías activas como el aprendizaje basado en proyectos o en problemas, eh, normalmente se tiende a pedirles unos informes a los estudiantes que vayan entregando avances o informes periódicos de, de lo que van haciendo o que vayan eh, presentando, sustentando qué, qué avances han tenido eh, y en esos puntos es donde se hace ese seguimiento cuando se les pide que, que entreguen o, o sustenten los avances que han tenido de un, del desarrollo de un proyecto, de un problema eh, es, es digamos ese seguimiento cómo se sienten involucrados porque realmente ellos son los que tienen que resolver ese problema o ese proyecto y, y tienen que ir mostrando que van avanzando y que van buscando una solución o planteando algo que puede ser válido o no válido, pero que les va a permitir identificar en qué han de pronto fallado cuando no se logra el objetivo o qué hicieron bien cuando lo logran de manera apropiada. Entonces, es, es esas entregas periódicas para mirar ese progreso y al, al momento que él va haciendo esas entregas, pues se va sintiendo involucrado y se da cuenta que todo depende, eh, su avance depende es propiamente de él, ¿no? El profesor le da las herramientas, le da los conocimientos, le, le facilita, es un facilitador y, y el estudiante es el que debe construir el proceso, ¿no? Yes, often um, in Australia, we talk about we're not the sage on the stage, we're the guide on the side. I don't know if that translates very well into Spanish, but it sounds very nice in English. <laughs> um, I have a, a question from Tobias here. Um, he says it's a difficult question. I don't know what the answer is, actually. He says every day we know more and more about how the brain works and how the brain learns. How can we implement strategies and take advice from neuroscience into online evaluation? A tricky question. I don't know. Riley, Adriana, who'd like to, who'd like to answer that? Do you have a response to that? <laughs> so I think Bloom's taxonomy, um, and I, if you don't know what that is or if you are unfamiliar with that term, I would suggest researching um, Bloom's taxonomy. It is quite a, a structured framework into learning. Um, what that framework teaches us, and that is based on cognitive learning abilities from all ranges of cognitive learning. Um, 
uh, that provides the tools, the equipment, and somewhat the advice as well on what to assess and how to assess and how a student may approach uh, a certain type of assessment. And it also gives us as educators a really good visual into what we're actually asking from the student and what we want them to learn, uh, how we're going to assess or evaluate them, um, and then come together and bring those skills to the table. So I think that taxonomy practice is definitely uh, something that we have learned from neuroscience in online assessment. Um, and I really think it depends on what we want the student to get out of the guiding them with. Thanks, Riley. Adriana, did you have anything to add from the neuroscience perspective? Sí, y los chicos aprenden diferente hoy en día, diferente a nuestra época o a mi época. Eh, normalmente siempre teníamos la concepción y nuestros padres decían lo que no se escribe no se aprende y, y uno era siempre tomando nota y apuntes y, y los chicos son visuales hoy en día. Ellos aprenden más con videos que con un texto o con un libro. Entonces tenemos que aprovechar también... Eh, Eh, esas, digamos, habilidades que han desarrollado para aprender de otra forma y, e incorporarlas en nuestros procesos formativos. Entonces, el, los programas en modalidad online o virtual permiten eh, apoyarnos y, y, y tener eh, un soporte en todo lo que son estas herramientas audiovisuales eh, para también complementar el proceso formativo en ellos. Eh, tenemos que tener en cuenta ese cambio que se ha dado en ellos, esa parte visual, auditiva, y digamos también incorporarla en todos los objetos virtuales que, que desarrollemos para los cursos. I think that's absolutely true. Um, and I agree that, you know, there, there are changes generationally and artificial intelligence is, is um, adding to that. But I think there are, there are already a lot of things that we know about how the brain works and how people learn. We know uh, when students get overloaded. We know that we can't have new concepts and new terminology, everything new at the same time, that you, you, know, you think about what's new and what's old so that you build in success. We know about scaffolding. Um, so there's a lot that we already know, um, but, but um, we need to continue to, to develop and, and um, to, to understand. So um, a question from David now. He says, um, the problem is actually teacher training or teacher education. How can we accelerate the process for teachers' transformation so that the tools that they use allow for the teaching and learning process to be significant and impactful. So that's a, it's a really good point, actually, around teacher and, and lecturer education. Um, Adriana, did you want to, to comment on that? Sí, ahí es clave la capacitación. Yo creo que en uno de los puntos que tocaba al principio hablaba de la capacitación de los docentes. O sea, primero identificar el programa, que nuestro programa, qué lo esperamos, a dónde, cuál es la perspectiva, el perfil que se espera, y después de eso la capacitación. Y eso es fundamental en nuestros docentes. Tenemos que cambiar como docentes nuestra, nuestras formas de, de llevar estrategias al aula. Tenemos que aprovechar los recursos. Tenemos que eh, realmente tomar conciencia de que no podemos, como lo decía. Eh, luchar contra eso, ni, ni prohibirlo, ni, ni cerrarnos, sino tenemos que mirar cómo, cómo los, los, los tomamos a favor y los aprovechamos y, y podemos poner, hacer las reflexiones con respecto a estos. Pero clave, la capacitación. Yeah, Riley, did you have anything to add around training educators? Absolutely. Now, at Macquarie, we are quite fortunate. We do have a team um, of staff who specifically help uh, academic staff uh, in terms of providing uh, education and getting our academic staff to think about different ways we can um, assess the student learning process mm. as well. Uh, but for those who don't have those resources, uh, reach out to a colleague, contact someone um, maybe who practices 
um, educative learning or art as, as well. Um, I'm more than happy uh, to have a conversation with absolutely anyone who wants to chat about a formative learning and assessment. And Pamela, I'm sure you would be the same as well. Um, so reach out to your friends uh, who may be uh, practicing uh, good practice, uh, because not only uh, does that encourage, I guess, and bring a sense of positive learning throughout shared colleagues, um, but what that tells us is that we also um, need to learn and continue learning as well, despite being the knowledge holders of education. Uh, I think it's also important uh, to kind of strip back all that red tape um, and become learners for life. Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, as teachers and educators, we have to be reflective practitioners and we have to consider how we need to continue to develop. You're right. I mean, we've here are resources um, and uh, others in your team have just released a whole range of beautiful online asynchronous material to support the educators at Macquarie in doing that. Um, and, and I think universities need to consider how they can support their staff uh, with, with similar initiatives. All right. Um, I, I'm going back to a, a, a core question around assessment and evaluation for uh, virtual programs now. Um, and the question is, do learning outcomes facilitate the assessment and evaluation of virtual programs? So it's kind of the, the connection between learning outcomes and assessment here. So Adriana, I don't know if you'd like to make a comment about how those two things interact rather than seeing assessment as kind of separate and uh, devoid of the learning outcomes or the content. Would you like to make a comment about that? Y es que cuando nosotros definimos los resultados de aprendizaje de nuestros programas, estamos diciendo al estudiante lo que le vamos a garantizar que él va a alcanzar o va a lograr en ese proceso formativo. ¿Sí? Entonces ya tenemos claro qué es lo que ellos deben, cuál es el conocimiento, las habilidades y las destrezas que ellos deben alcanzar. Como ya le estamos dejando claro esas, eh, digamos, esos resultados que esperamos que ellos logren al, final, al terminar su, su programa, profesional o técnico, tecnológico, pues tenemos que diseñar todas las estrategias y, y, los, y los contenidos también de nuestros cursos y nuestro plan de estudio debe contribuir a que, a que se logre, a que se alcance. Entonces eso debe estar articulado, las estrategias de aula y, y los contenidos que les damos a nuestros estudiantes pues deben contribuir a que ellos logren o alcancen esos resultados paulatinamente durante todo su proceso de formación. ¿Y cómo vamos verificando que los van alcanzando? Pues a través de ese seguimiento y esa evaluación, ¿no? Eh, la evaluación tenemos que verla desde dos, desde dos puntos de vista. Una es el, eh, para decirle al estudiante cómo va avanzando en su proceso, cómo ha apropiado esos conocimientos y si, digamos, aprueba o no aprueba uno de esos cursos y si se está, está alcanzando ese resultado. Y otra forma de verlo ya es a nivel del programa académico para reflexionar al interior ya, digamos, de qué ajustes hay que hacerle de pronto al programa. Entonces es cuando le hacemos seguimiento a los resultados de aprendizaje para el mejoramiento continuo de los programas académicos. Ya no para decirle al estudiante está alcanzando o no alcanzando el resultado, sino para mirar cómo va el proceso de un grupo de estudiantes frente a esos resultados de aprendizaje y mirar si es que de pronto tenemos que cambiar estrategias de aula, si de pronto tenemos que incorporar unos contenidos en unas asignaturas, si de pronto tenemos que dotar unos laboratorios con algo especial. Entonces, eh, digamos que ahí es donde, donde se, se enfoca esa incorporación de los resultados de aprendizaje, a mirar esa evaluación desde esos dos puntos de vista y eso pues va a llevar a que, a, a que cuando hacemos esa evaluación para el mejoramiento de los programas, eh, nos revisamos, nos, nos miramos al interior de los programas, hacemos ajustes y vamos creando una cultura de mejoramiento continuo y de, y de fortalecimiento de nuestros programas académicos. Yeah, um, um, I'd like to share something that is very common at Macquarie and in, in Australia more generally around learning outcomes and, and assessment. Um, and we take a view that we have to have course level design. And when I say course, I mean the, the program at the higher level, so the, the degree itself. Um, 
we have to design the whole course. And from that, we design each what we call unit, which is the individual classes that students take. And you have to think about the unit learning outcomes, how they map to course learning. Outcomes. And then we think about how the assessment maps to the unit learning outcomes and the content. If you teach your content because it's important to get the content across and then think, how am I going to assess it? You're going to have a mess. At the design stage, if you look at what are the outcomes at the higher level, what are the outcomes unit by unit, and how are we going to get there? In some cases, you might have a backwards design where you design the assessment and you think how you're going to get there. Um, so at Macquarie, we, we follow a process that's called DDI, Design, Develop, Implement. And when we're designing a new degree or a new diploma, um, we get all of the academics in the room together and we think about the, the learning outcomes of the course, then the learning outcomes of the units, the way we're going to assess it. And we look across different units to make sure that you don't want 25 essays and nothing else across the entirety of a three-year degree. So it allows you to look at the variety, to look at the level of Bloom's taxonomy, um, to map your unit learning outcomes to your assessment. Where are you matching your learning outcomes to assessment? So I don't know, Riley, if you wanted to make a comment about that. Just to emphasize the importance that it should be all connected your course or bachelor or master program unit learning outcomes um, or course program learning outcomes must be aligned with the unit learning outcomes, which also must be aligned with what we're teaching students and further down the chain, the assessment items as well. I think it's very important to highlight that it should be and must be all connected to each other. Yeah, and the term that we usually use for that in Australia is so I might I might just hand over to Adriana for any final comments around the notion of constructive alignment before we wrap up. No, no, muy interesante. Aquí nos podíamos quedar conversando todo el resto de la de la noche ya para nosotros y de la mañana para ustedes. Pero pero nos deja eh, digamos muchas enseñanzas, muchos puntos de vista, muchas cosas para reflexionar a nivel de, de, de nosotros, del rol que tenemos como profesores y, y mucho trabajo por, por hacer. Thanks very much, um, Adriana and Riley, for a really interesting uh, discussion. Um, thank you so much to the Australian Embassy in Colombia for putting on these four sessions. They've been very interesting. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to invite uh, Adriana from Conastes and Riley and I from Macquarie University to be this. Thank you very much. Um, over to you, uh, uh, Andrea. Muchísimas uh, gracias, Pamela, eh, por tu excelente moderación el día de hoy en esta sesión y por supuesto a nuestros ponentes. Uh, Riley O'Keefe y a la doctora Adriana Chamara Reyes. Todos sus comentarios, sus experiencias y sus per perspectivas eh, sin duda han sido muy interesantes y nos han dado mucho en qué pensar. A todos los asistentes que nos han acompañado hoy y durante cada miércoles del último mes, muchísimas gracias por su interés y por su contribución al diálogo entre Australia y Colombia sobre política educativa. Este tipo de actividades como este, esta serie de webinars son eh, muy importantes para acercar a nuestros gobiernos, a las instituciones y a las personas y fomentar los vínculos eh, que incluso mediante eh, el aprovechamiento, que, que fomentan el aprovechamiento eh, y la cooperación educativa, eh, ya sea virtual o presencial. Eh, en particular, nos gustaría mucho agradecer el magnífico trabajo que han realizado nuestros intérpretes de Fox Interpretation durante el último mes. Ellos han sido eh, más que capaces de eh, crear puentes entre las diferencias lingüísticas para que pudiéramos tener y mantener conversaciones muy detalladas y muy técnicas sobre 
eh, educación en inglés y en español. Muchísimas gracias por todo su apoyo, ha sido muy valioso. Muchísimas gracias también a nuestros colegas del Ministerio de Educación Nacional por su apoyo en la organización y en la eh, copresentación de esta serie de, de webinars. Eh, hay mucho trabajo detrás eh, de ellos que no siempre es visible en la pantalla eh, para traer a, a la realidad las ideas y estamos muy, muy, muy contentos de haber tenido más de eh, 400 personas participando en, los, en, en estos webinars en los últimos eh, cuatro sesiones eh, para el Departamento de Educación de Australia. Esperamos seguir trabajando con nuestros socios colombianos para desarrollar eh, este tipo de actividades y, y diálogos en, en, en futuras ocasiones. Eh, además, eh, le sugerimos seguir al Ministerio de Educación Nacional en redes sociales y eh, también a la Embajada de Australia en Colombia para que tengan actualizaciones sobre lo que está sucediendo en la relación bilateral. Muy probablemente pondremos ahí también cuando estén disponibles las grabaciones de, de esta serie de webinars. Y creo que eh, por ahora esto sería todo por, por nuestra parte. Y eh, te regreso eh, la palabra, Pamela, para que podamos cerrar este último webinar. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Thanks very much, Andrea Valencia and uh, um, Adriana Reyes and Riley O'Keefe. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you found today's session useful. Um, go and have a look at Bloom's Taxonomy. Go and have a look at the resources on ChatGPT. Um, and let's hope that we uh, interact in some way in the future. Thank you so much, everybody. Good evening.